Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, party people. It is time for an office hours speed round where we go through and answer a whole lot of questions in a very short period of time because a lot of them piled up in the queue don't need very detailed answers. So first up we have, first up we have They Blame Me who says, what is your view on using DAC pack diffs versus old style update scripts? I couldn't care less. I don't get into the DevOps or deployment businesses, so you use whatever works well for you. The thing that I'd warn you about things like DAC packs is, is they will repeatedly try to redeploy something that maybe you want or take away something that maybe you want in production, but you don't need as part of source control, like customized indexes for specific clients. Next up, we have Alex who says, Hi boss, I have an app that creates a new database for each customer. Got about 3,000 databases all with the same structure. Is there a good strategy to consolidate everything back together into one, dat one database? And is that a good idea? No, not at all. Leave it the way that you have it. If, go ahead and search on Google for Brent Ozar SaaS or multi-client databases. And I have a post out there that gives you the pros and cons of each uh, design. Yes, high availability and disaster recovery is much harder when every client is inside its own uh, database, but there are all kinds of other advantages to that model as well. I don't care which one you use, but once you've already used one and designed the app to work with it, roll with that one. Don't waste money trying to change it. Next, uh, Perplexed asked, I had a vendor application running a stored procedure and it wasn't working. I used Profiler to capture an error message and I passed that on to the vendor to fix. Is there a better way to find error messages that procs are kicking out? You found something that works for you. Use it. I bet this is a task that you don't have to do very often. Don't waste time trying to optimize tasks that you rarely have to do. I do like that you asked, and the short answer is that there's not a lot of easy ways to do it. Profile is still one of the easiest ways. You could also do extended events, but I would argue that that has a higher learning curve for something that you hardly do every now and then. Next up, we have Peter who asks, is there anything comparable to the first responder kit for Postgres? I haven't seen one. He says, how hard would it be to write a first responder kit for Postgres? Well, me and dozens of other people have been working in our spare time on the first responder kit for like a decade. So it's not a small task. It would be a pretty big task. But if you find one, definitely let me know. Next up, we have hash match. I have a work superior who prefers to use several update statements instead of joins. I don't even understand what that means. He says, how do I best demonstrate this isn't a good idea for performance? We'll just write the two queries. If you believe that someone's doing something in a bad way, go write it in a better way and show them what the performance difference is. If your way isn't immediately measurably faster, well, then you have your answer. But the nice thing is that you can do this in private first before you talk to them just so that you can actually be confident that you have a faster way of doing it. Next up, Stephen asks, Hi Brent, in a nightly, trans or a nightly ETL process, extract, transform, load, a friend of mine has two procs updating one table in parallel. He's getting a page level deadlock randomly. Any tips or resources on how to fix deadlocks while keeping procs parallel? Yes, check out the blocking modules in my mastering index tuning class, mastering query tuning class, and mastering server tuning class. Watch the one in Mastering Index Tuning if you can only change indexes to fix the problem. Watch the one in Mastering Query Tuning if you can only use queries to fix the problem. And watch the one in Mastering Server Tuning if you want to take a look at how to solve the problem with server level options, things like changing to RCSI. I say that that's a database level option, but it really requires server level work. So hit those blocking modules over in each of my classes. Next up, Peter asks, do you have any recommended tools for diffing two tables for showing the indexes differences between two tables? Yep, Redgate Schema Compare. Redgate Schema Compare is kind of the world standard default for that kind of thing. Uh, it's even scriptable, so you can uh, automate it with tools like PowerShell. 
Next up, Bjorgvin asks, do you ever see any issues with using Windows mount points in SQL Server? Not in the last 10 years. Like 10, 15 years ago, when mount points were first becoming popular, I saw a lot of problems where people would monitor drive space at the drive level instead of individual volumes like mount points. So they'd be like, yeah, the D drive has lots of space. And then they'd run the mount point on the D drive absolutely out of space. And they'd wonder why SQL Server went down. Aside from that, that's the only big ones that I've seen recently. Next up, TY says, hi, Brent. In my job, we often use rollbacks for testing. <sighs> Is there an easy way to roll back after two or more days? Ah, where's my button for screaming? <laughs> like a checkpoint where you can return to. You want database snapshots. Database snapshots will give you the ability to roll back to a prior point in time. I would argue, though, that if you're going back two or more days, what you should probably be doing is a database restore instead. Next up, Peter asks, do you think we're ever going to get for show plan runtime parameter collection in SQL Server 2019 again? This is a feature that shipped in 2019 by default. It wasn't named anything. Just all of a sudden, we could see parameters and execution plans uh, uh, by default in certain places. Uh, and they ended up disabling it a cumulative update. I want to say it was around like CU6 or CU7. I don't think we're ever going to see it again because nobody knew what the feature was. It was never announced publicly. It was something that we just kind of discovered when we were spelunking through execution plans. And I don't think Microsoft would waste testing resources uh, in trying to reintroduce something that they never announced in the first place. Uh, he says, is this feature worth upgrading from SQL Server 2019 to 2022? Given that you have to turn it on and given that they tell you not to turn it on because performance overhead is so bad, I'd probably say no. Next up, Mickey says, Hi, Brent. I've got a reporting query that runs in under 10 seconds on some environments, but for hours in another environment. I've identified that stats are up to date and indexes are the same. Any other recommendations? Yes. Look at the query plan. In my Fundamentals of Query Tuning class and Mastering Query Tuning class, I teach you how to compare execution plans between two servers. Now, you're saying you can't get a plan because the query takes hours to run. Start with the estimated plan. If the shapes of the two estimated plans are different, that's your first clue that there's something inside those that is different, like different settings at the server level, for example, different amounts of hardware resources. Gromit asks, do you have a good way to fix high VLF counts that don't break log shipping? No. 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 Sorry. <laughs> Next up, Nick Smith says, why might performance get worse over time? And I'm seeing high weights that are SOS scheduler yield and SOS work dispatcher. That means that you have a CPU bottleneck. What you'll want to do is forget things like temp tables or schema locks that are in your question and focus on which queries are using the most CPU. Something is firing up using CPU on that server. Or if it's a VM, it could also be a noisy neighbor in another VM. Next up, let's see here. Lost in Space has an interesting one. I have developers using a wait for delay of like 10 or 15 minutes to pause iterations of his code instead of doing it in C sharp. It leaves suspended connections. Is this good or bad? For me, the reason why I don't like this is if the code has any kind of errors where it opens a transaction and doesn't close, uh, commit it or roll it back then just doing the delay will leave that trans transaction open for a very long time. That's the part I'm worried about. So I would rather have him, when his process is finished, close the database connection so that you can be assured that there's no transactions hanging open in the database. But that's just my own personal preference because I've been burned by that open transactions so many times. Next up, uh, working for demand says, I'm a DBA for a city with a hybrid environment. When I was gone, IT pushed through a service pack. Should you re re suggest reverting to a previous service pack or feature pack? No, I once it's already in, any kind of change to the environment is risk. 
and taking out a service pack or a feature pack is risk as well. I wouldn't want you to get in trouble for that. If anybody gets in trouble for something being broken, at least now it's not your fault. It was the fault of whoever pushed that service pack through. Next up, Hadar asks, do you have any recommended books or courses for sizing Azure VMs for the lift and shift of SQL Server? Let's see. Any recommended courses? Do I know anybody who does training courses? Hmm. I wonder if, if anybody that I know has a website where you could click a link called training and it would have a course called, say, for example, running SQL Server in the cloud. Wouldn't that be cool? I don't know anybody like that, Hadar. But I think you do because you posted a question on his website. Moving on. Doc asks, do you encounter peeps that live on cruise ships in retirement? And is this an option for you? I have never met anyone who actually does that outside of there's a cruise ship called Residency, uh, MS The World, if I remember right. Uh, and I've met people who both lived on that and worked on that. But that's kind of different. It's like a, a, a condo on a cruise ship. Uh, but for people who live on regular cruise ships, I, I haven't actually seen that happen. And I think it's almost more of an urban legend than it is an actual thing. It's not an option for me because the bandwidth is terrible and I really miss cars. Like I love my car collection. Uh, next up, Ron says, what diagnostics would you recommend for a SQL server that's fully 100% CPU throttle during query execution due to a bad query plan and you can't get a connection and a hard reboot seems the only option? The DAC, dedicated admin connection. If you go to brentozar.com slash go slash DAC, D-A-C, you'll learn how to use the DAC, how you can get a connection even when the box seems unusable and you can run diagnostics through there. Next up, Nortsy asks, Hi Brent, recently had a SQL statement with a begin tran and a commit tran that was executed from SSMS and returned a results message. We had a blocking issue and it turns out this query was never finished. What do you think could have caused this? They didn't run the commit. They didn't run the commit. Anytime a user tells you that they ran the whole query, and trust me, they highlighted all of it, and it couldn't possibly be their fault, they are lying to you. I know it's hard to believe that someone could lie to you, but maybe they even believe that they highlighted the commit. Maybe they also ran several queries leading up to that moment. Maybe they tested it several times and kept beginning a TRAN every time and then thought that that one commit would commit everything. Sadly, it did not. Uh, next up, TY says, Hi, Brent. It seems like you know everything about SQL Server. At least seems like it. <laughs> it only seems like it. Can you do a short session with something you don't know much about and lead us through the process of learning it? It would be very beneficial to see how you build your knowledge. The way that I do it is that I find a, a real world problem I have to solve. I can't learn everything inside the engine. It's just too big and I have to focus on things that my clients actually need. So I find a real world problem that I need to solve and then I go solve that. When I'm working with a brand new version of SQL Server and no client is using it yet, I take one of my past client problems and then I try to solve that in the new version. Like when Microsoft says, Feature X will magically solve Y, I'll go through and actually try to get Feature X to mass, uh, actually solve Y. And then I'll try to break Feature X to find where the uh, edge cases are where it doesn't work. And then we'll do one more. Uh, Marcus the German asks, how do you recommend that the SQL, or Brent, do you recommend that the SQL Server instance collation is the same as the user databases? Yes. If yes, how should we deal with databases which have a different collation? That's fine. You leave them on there. Sometimes you'll get third-party vendor applications where they picked their own collation. Generally, those third-party vendor applications don't need to join to any other database. And they tend to not have problems in TempDB because the users or the vendors already probably hit those problems, so they know how to cast for specific collations uh, when they're doing joins over into TempDB. So it's fine. You can put them inside the same database server. If the author comes to you and says, I'm having errors due to collations, then you can say, OK, great, here's why. We can't give you your own database server, or we can if you pay for it. 
but you're going to have to change your co your casting of collations whenever you hop over to different user databases or over to tempdb google the user the error message that they get and it's a really common easy problem to solve with plenty of examples out there online well, that wraps it up for today's office hours. Holy smokes, we did a ton of questions inside the span of 15 minutes. I uh, hope you had fun, and I will see you all next time. Adios.